welcome. What a privilege it is for us to get together. What an honor. You know, and I just feel led right off the top. I believe we should just start with prayer right away. I know some of you need a healing in your body. Some of you may need a job. Some of you need something way even beyond that. Some healing in your heart, in your mind. You're struggling with fear. You're being tormented. God wants to set you free right now, even before we get into His Word. Precious Heavenly Father, in the name of King Jesus, I announce freedom and healing over the sick, over the lame. Father, by the word in 1 Peter 2, 24, by Jesus' stripes already paid for at the cross, I command healing, I legislate healing for the sick. Lord, I loose the blind from their blindness and the deaf from their deafness. And Lord, I declare that the lame can get up and walk in the name of Jesus to the glory of God the Father. And Lord, I loose every mind from the spirit of depression and from oppression. Lord God, you have given us life and given it to us more abundantly. Jesus, you came to supply all of our needs, even if it's a job, even if it's an assignment and a work. According to Philippians 4 verse 19, I declare that God has met all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Jesus. God, be magnified and glorified in your children's lives by showing up mighty here on earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven in Jesus. Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. I'm so glad we get to be together and we get to enjoy God's presence. And I just really believe right now the Holy Spirit is right there with you and he is going to breathe the word into your heart, into the soil of your heart and bring forth life lasting fruit and good news. We all need some good news right now, don't we? So as we continue our series, get help Give Help, part two of our series. I really believe that God is going to unfold His Word and our lives will never be the same again. I th I'm so thankful. Every time I come to God's Word, I learn something new. How about you? Let's do a quick little review. That was completely unintentional, all those rhymes in a row, but I believe it was for somebody. <laughs> review, Matthew 7, verses 7 and 12. Remember, this is Jesus talking. And in part one of Get Help, Give Help, we learn that Jesus said this. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open unto you. And then verse 12, Jesus said, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. So he's given us the law of reciprocity built right into the ask, the, the seeking and the knocking, right? He's saying, whatever you want men to do for you, do also for them, for this is the law and the prophets. We learned that we are all meant to get help, all of us. There's no exclusions. We all need to get help, but we are all called to give help. There's something you've got that you can give. God will never ask you to give something that you don't have. A true ask requires humility. That's what we learned. Even Jesus modeled the ask, right? Even Jesus. Sometimes you can't help a person without getting them into the give help mode. And Jesus modeled that when he even ministered to people. The woman at the well, he asked her for a glass of water. Imagine that. God Almighty asking somebody else, some precious woman in the heat of the day, if she would get him some water. And here's the biggie. I just want to bring you back to this. God never asks you for something that you don't have. He didn't ask the, remember when we talked about the prophet who asked the widow for a little piece of her cake. She was getting a little piece of cake ready for her and her son to die. The prophet didn't say, hey, could you get me a turkey dinner? No, he asked her for a little bit of that cake that last little bit she had, and it was in her giving that, in her giving help, that she got a whole life of help, right? It saved her and her son's life. So today, we're going to keep going on as we go on Get Help Part 2, and we're going to talk about mentors and advisors. You need mentors and advisors. If you're going to get help, you need mentors and advisors in your life. We all need mentors and advisors. Without exception, no exclusion, everyone needs to get help. The question is, or at least the question we all should be asking ourselves is this, who does God want me to get help from? Who does God want me to get advice and counsel from? The short answer is mentors, advisors, teachers, leaders, those whom God qualifies for your life. Because you see, God is very particular about who mentors and advises you. 
because he has a very specific plan for your life. And his plans, we already know from Jeremiah 29, 11, they're good. They're outrageously good, his plans are. He is watchful and he is an invested father. And he doesn't want just anybody giving his daughter or son advice, marriage advice, right? A life advice, life coaching. He wants you to get it from the right people. God loves you. My friend, he loves you dearly. And because he loves you so much, he is particular about who mentors and advises you. That's how precious you are. So let's look at Jesus as a boy on his trip to the big city. Jesus is about 12 years old. He's going to, at that point, there was no New York City. So I guess the big apple of the world was Jerusalem. And Jesus is going to the big city with all of his relatives and cousins and uncles and aunts. It's a big caravan. They get to the city. They do their business. But then they're on their way home in the caravan. They go a few days journey and Mary and Joseph are frantic. They find out Jesus is not with them. Oh my goodness, we've left him back in the big city. So they've got to go back to the big city. And we pick up the story here in Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 46 to 49. And then we'll skip down to 52. Look at this. Three days later, they found him, Jesus, in the court of the temple, sitting among the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. What was Jesus doing? Both listening to them and asking them questions. Verse 47, all who heard Jesus were amazed by his intelligence and his understanding and his answers. Verse 48, when they saw Jesus, his parents, when his parents saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed. And his mother said this to Jesus, son, why have you treated us like this? She wasn't happy. She said, listen, your father and I have been greatly distressed and anxiously looking for you. And Jesus answered her this, and you got to hear this. This is amazing. Jesus said, why did you have to look for me? Did you not know that I had to be? Let me read that again. Did you not know that I had to be? Listen to that sentence. I had to be in my father's house. Mom, dad, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And then, you know, she gives him a reprimand. And he, the Bible says that he, Jesus goes home with his parents. And look at verse 52. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. I want you to think about this for a moment. Jesus got help. Jesus submitted to mentors and advisors. We often talk about being like Jesus or asking ourselves, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Well, here it is, my friend. Like, you don't have to guess at what Jesus would do. See, too many Christians go through life going, I wonder what would Jesus do in this situation? I just wonder. I want, you don't have to wonder. We've got the Word of God, the roadmap for life eternal right in front of us. Don't wonder. No, you need to know the Word of God. All Scripture is God-breathed and inspired teaching for us to live our lives. So what would Jesus do? Well, here it is. Jesus got help. Jesus got wisdom, counsel, understanding. Jesus got in the Father's house. He didn't just ask anybody. He went in the Father's house asking the right people. I've got to come back to that verse 49. And Jesus saying to them, he says, Did you not know that I had to be? I had to be, Jesus said. What about you? Do you really know in your life, based on God's plans for your life, where you have to be? See, there's a lot of things that we assume that we have to be. But do you really know where you have to be? Jesus, at 12 years old, said to his mom and dad, I, like, why did you have to spend three days looking for me? Like, did you think I'd be at the arcade? Did you think I'd be in the basketball court? Did you think I'd be out fishing? Did you think I would be? He said, did you not know? Like, don't you know my assignment? I had to be you and I, listen to me, you are so precious to God. There is a place where you have to be. And if you're not in, you're out. Remember that? When we talked about in the series Connected, if you're not in the connection, you're outside. And no matter how hard you work, no matter how hard you work at your marriage, 
It's not because you're a bad person. It's not because you're a major failure. It's because when you're trying to do the right thing, but you're trying to make something work and you're outside God's plan and you don't understand, you have to be in. See, Jesus understood. Did you not know I had to be in? Jesus had to be in. If Jesus has to be in, what about you? Don't you realize you've got to be in the right connections, the right fellowship? You need to get help. I need to get help, but we need to be in the right place to get it. And we're not talking about a building. We're talking about the right relationships, the right advisors and mentors. So let's look again at how Jesus got H-E-L-P. Right. Let's go back to our acronym that I made just for you because you're so precious with the Lord's help. Help. Right. Let's talk about H. That means you have to have you got to know you got to be a haver in life. You can't be a not haver. You got to know what to have and what to what you don't have. You got to be able to do a realistic inventory of your life. Jesus had an assignment. He knew I've got an assignment, but he knew I need more wisdom. We read Jesus had to increase in wisdom and he had to increase in favor with God and with man. I think about that and I think, Stephen, if Jesus had to increase in favor with God and with man, don't you think I do? Don't you think you do? If Jesus had to increase in wisdom, don't you think you do? Then we got E, express, H for have, E for express. You've got to express the ask. Express your thanks. You've got to express your honesty. You know, you've got to ask the right questions. The Bible says that in Luke 2, Jesus asks the right people the right questions. You got to express. You got to say, hey, I need more wisdom. Jesus did it. Why can't we do it? Then you got L for lead. You got to be able to identify the lead. Isn't that so? He said, I had to be in my father's house. He said, I know where the lead is. I know where the mentors and the advisors are. And I had to be and identify the lead and be in my father's house. You got to source out wisdom. Wisdom just doesn't grow on trees. You got to get the right advisors and mentors. Wisdom is at the entrance, the book of Proverbs says. You got to source out wisdom. And then P, finally, for pursue, ask and keep on asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, keep giving, keep expecting, right? You've got to pursue. I'm amazed at how many times I meet good people that are unwilling to pursue what God has for them. Why would you not? If Jesus had to pursue, why don't we have to pursue? Are you better than Jesus? Well, of course, you know, that's not true. So let's go through it again. First, Jesus took advantage of the opportunity to have, right, for H, have access to his father's house. Jesus took advantage of the opportunity to have access to mentors and advisors. He grabbed the opportunity. That's why he said, Mom, did you really think I'd be at the arcade or down in the mall? Like, I mean, just goofing around? Like, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house, you gotta, you gotta have, right? You gotta be a haver. And number two, Jesus expressed his desire for wisdom by asking great questions with great respect. Jesus, the son of God, wasn't offish with his teachers and his mentors. He submitted himself to them and he asked the teachers and the lawyers questions. He expressed his need. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business, my father's house? Third, Jesus identified the lead. We talked about that, God's direction, God's mentors, advisors, and teachers. Jesus' decision to follow God's lead, think about this, brought his whole family into God's house. I wonder what Mary and Joseph heard when they were in the father's house that they otherwise wouldn't have heard because they were following their son who was following the lead. You want to change the world? Let God lead you on the inside and you change you and let him use you as an agent to change the world. And then fourth, Jesus wasn't passive about God's wisdom, but he pursued it. He pursued favor. Jesus did not pursue the games and the distractions of the big city. No, no. But rather, Jesus pursued answers to his questions. He pursued favor with God. You would think the Son of God, if anybody could be excluded from the pursuit of of chasing favor and chasing wisdom, I think we would give it to the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, right? But no, 
Jesus was not excluded from pursuing wisdom and favor. Again, I come back to, if Jesus had to pursue wisdom and understanding, why do we think that we are exempt? I'm not exempt. You're not exempt. Why do we think we're exempt from taking inventory and not having to be thankful for what we have? If you've got a dollar in your pocket, why would you think you're exempt from not being thankful for that one dollar? If you've got any air, oxygen in your lung, even if you've only got one lung, why would you think that you're exempt from being thankful for that? If your heart's going to beat in the next second, there it is. Why would you think that you're exempt from being thankful for that heartbeat? You have more than you realize. You're just not recognizing what you have. And why would we think we're we're exempt from expressing the ask? I mean, if Jesus had to ask for wisdom, why would we think we're exempt from it? And why would we ever imagine that God would not have us submit to leadership? My friend, if Jesus submitted to leadership, why is it we think that we're, it's a trick from the enemy. The enemy's trying to deceive us into thinking that we're excluded from these good things. They're good things. That he's trying to redefine his bad. Well, you don't want to be under leadership. You don't want somebody telling you what to do. No, 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 no. You, you've got it all. Come on. Be honest. We all need to submit to leadership. If Jesus had to submit to leadership, you and me, we have to submit to leadership. It's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And why do we think that wisdom is not something to pursue? If Jesus had to pursue wisdom, why not you, right? No wonder Jesus was willing to ask and get help himself. He's the one that told us, let's back up on a review, Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. He said, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. We just watch Jesus modeling that for us. And verse 8, for everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be open to him. Praise God. Jesus is not telling us to do anything that he didn't practice himself. He he wasn't a hypocrite. He did it himself and modeled it for us. So let's just go over this. How do we really do the ask effectively? How do we get help effectively? I mean, let's just drill down on this and figure out if we're doing it right. Maybe you think, well, I think I'm asking. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just not doing it right. Well, let's take a look at this. Number one, you got to start with humility. A good ask requires the right posturing. You know, I've heard of people, I've got friends who are employers. They've got sometimes this young person walking in asking for a job and there's no humility. There's no posturing to receive. It's all about them trying to say, well, this is, you know, these are my boundaries and this is what, you know, I won't do for you and I won't do this and I won't do that. Do I get the job? That's not how to ask for work. That's not how to ask right? You've got to ask and start with humility. That means you have to be honest about your need and respectful about who's going to lead. You've got to identify the lead in the ask and you've got to be respectful. You know, the word respect comes from the Latin, which means to delay entrance. You know, when a young man holds open the door for an older woman as she's, you know, maybe slow getting off the curb and getting in through the, into the building, when a young man delays his entrance, it speaks volumes. It speaks respect. Have we lost the art of respect? You've got to start with humility. Start with a delayed entrance. Number two, identify the real problem. You gotta be able to identify the real challenge. I know so many people that often want a solution to the symptom instead of the real problem. You know, like for example, maybe they have a really bad rash. They they want the rash to go away, but they don't realize the root of the problem might be a fungus or a candida in their bloodstream that could lead to a disease in their body. God wants to get to the root of the problem. He doesn't want to just make the rash go away. It's kind of like your oil light going on in your car, right? So we see the oil light go on in the car and we're thinking, oh, danger. We, we want that oil light to go off. But do you really just want the oil light to go off or do you want the problem fixed? Because if some guy thinking he's doing you a favor just clips the wire that's going to your oil light and you still have the problem, you're about to lose your engine. We're talking thousands of dollars of repairs, right? 
You got to get to the root of the problem. You got to be able to identify the real problem. Number three, pursue expert counsel. That's why I'm talking about mentors and advisors. You got to be able to pursue expert counsel, not personal comfort. I had to put that in there because a lot of times people think I'm pursuing expert counsel. Jennifer, you know, Bill, he did it again. And you know, I'm telling you, I just, I, I can't take it anymore. Well, if Jennifer's only agreeing with you on the phone about your pet peeves, about your husband, well, then you're not pursuing expert counsel, even though Jennifer's making you very comfortable and telling you how great you are and all that kind of stuff. You need to pursue expert counsel and not personal comfort. Too often people like to talk about their problem with people who agree with them, but aren't qualified by God to bring wisdom into the equation. When getting help, H-E-L-P, distinguish the difference between getting answers and getting affirmation. Can I just say that again? Distinguish the difference between getting answers and affirmation. Affirmation isn't bad, but if it's at the expense of answers, you're being deluded, you're being misled. Many people can't or won't do this. They like the comfort, the temporary comfort of a little bit of affirmation, but they still don't have the answer, right? If your marriage has been stuck after 20 years, that means you've got too much affirmation and not enough answer. You need to start getting mentors that give you answers and maybe even inflict a little bit of pain. You know, I go to the doctor, sometimes he pokes a needle in me or something like that. It's a little bit of pain to get to the answer. And number four, apply, practice, and measure. Apply, practice, and measure over and over. You know, I'm a guitar player, and when I'm learning a difficult passage, I never practice without measurement. Measurement, Stephen, I put on the metronome, it clicks, and it gives me, and I may even start very slow, but I know of a reality where I'm at. I can measure it, and I let that metronome click away at a certain tempo, and then I tune my guitar, and then I retune, and then I tune it again. I'm very um, intentional about watching the click and watching the tuning. There's always ways to measure your, your progress. So apply, practice, and measure. Right, So we're talking about how to ask with humility, identify the real problem. Number three, expert counsel. And number four, you've got to apply, practice, and measure. That's how you, you, that's how you apply the help. If you're going to get help, you got to take it. you got to take that metronome and you got to apply the measurement. you got to apply the measuring tape right before you cut the wood. You measure. What do carpenters say? Measure twice, cut once. If you're afraid of being measured, then you don't understand the art of getting help. If you're afraid of being measured and accountable, then you may have been abused by somebody who called themselves a leader or somebody who was unqualified as a mentor at some point in your life. Which brings me to this point. How do you identify a qualified mentor or advisor? I'm talking about a biblical, biblically approved mentor and advisor. Well, number one, they don't mind you making mistakes. If you've got somebody in your life who you think is a mentor or a leader and they make a big deal of every mistake and they shame you, condemn you, you don't have the right mentor and the right leader. Listen, real leaders don't mind you making mistakes. Their focus is on the process of you learning wisdom. They're good with the process. They understand there's going to be little failures along the way. As they're teaching their little child to tie their shoes, they understand it's not going to be perfect the first time. There's going to be little micro failures, little mistakes in the process of learning the art of tying your shoes. Qualified mentors and advisors, they are not intimidated by your success. They're good with you winning and overcoming. I remember talking to a very wise older man. Um, he was actually a pastor very wise man, and he could tell me this. He said, Stephen, he said, listen, when it comes to um, leaders who are intimidated by success, he said, I call that, they got the squirrel mentality. I was like, the squirrel mentality? He said, oh yeah, squirrels. He says, the male squirrel is fine with um, having kids. He wants to have little pups, little baby squirrels. He's fine with getting a mate and you know, um, making more of himself. He's good with that. But when he sees little baby boy squirrels come along, he gets this inherent desire to want to castrate his sons because he doesn't want them replicating themselves in the next generation. Friends, that's not good. That's 
Squirrel mentality leadership is not good. You, there's a lot of times you have a leader that wants to replicate and he wants the conversions, the numbers. She wants more people, but she doesn't want them to grow up and get strong. That's not good leadership or mentorship. Good leaders are not controlling or manipulating. Mentors don't push, they lead, they go in front, they take the brunt of the storm. Listen, good leaders accept you, but they don't tolerate you staying the same and not growing or wallowing in self-pity. Good leaders want you to grow. And to, you know, this is another great one. Mentors and advisors, they, they do much more than just relate to you. They challenge you. They provoke you to movement, right? Movement is so important. You know, if you physically in your muscles or your legs or your arms, you begin to atrophy, you know what happens is you lose that organ or you lose that limb. You lose use of it. It becomes dead to you. It's the same thing emotionally, mentally, intellectually, spiritually. You cannot tolerate um, non-movement or to, to begin to atrophy in any area of your life. You need to have movement. You need to, leaders provoke you to movement, you to movement, not just to serve them, but to growth. They want you to grow and eliminate the, the bad stuff in your life. So good leaders, they will qualify you for access. Remember, Jesus said, ask, seek, and knock. And if you're not doing that, you should be disqualified from access until you do. Otherwise, you develop a false belief about life your identity, and your purpose. You know, there's something special that happens in the ask. And if you do not allow your protégés to be qualified by the ask, you do them a disservice. You hurt them. You teach them um, socialism. You teach them to, um, you know, pursue things without being qualified for them. You know, imagine if somebody had a heart and a desire to become an engineer and you gave him the five-star job today on his first day of school. Well, the problem is he doesn't have the education. The problem is he hasn't been qualified yet. If you gave him the position before you gave him the qualification, he's going to hurt himself, hurt other people. He's going to hurt the job. He's going to hurt the design. You have to qualify people before you give them the position. You have to make them qualify, and then they take ownership of it. And then they feel like they're successful because they are successful in something. Qualified mentors and advisors, listen, they should direct you to include other experts. They shouldn't be isolationists. They shouldn't be like, oh, you only listen to me. I don't want you going to any other mentors. No other advisors in your life. I'm the one-stop shop. There's no such thing. Ephesians 4 talks about God giving us, um, equipping us with lots of uh, the right things in the body of Christ. Apostles, teachers, preachers, um, um, evangelists, prophets. We need the fivefold ministry, but there is no one who has an exclusive um, narrow bandwidth on all of this stuff. You need to have access to all the body of Christ and the right mentors and the right leaders in your life. Somebody may be a perfect mentor in your life for your marriage, but then another person may be a wonderful mentor in your life for finances. You need different advisors and leaders, and a good advisor and mentor will never promote exclusion to you that they are the only one. So let's get to a story, a biblical story, and see how this help thing works. Um, let me tell you a story about a woman named Ruth. It's all in the book, um, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the book of Ruth. And so let's get Ruth to show us how to get help. She's quite an amazing woman. In the book of Ruth, we're introduced to a family that has gone through a lot. Naomi, her husband and two boys, they moved from Bethlehem to Moab because there's a great famine in the land, nothing to eat. And they're not there that long, and Naomi's husband dies. Naomi's now a widow. Then shortly after her boys, they get married to two beautiful Moabite girls. Well, then the, both of the sons of Naomi, they die. Now the daughter-in-laws, they're both widows. So now... Not only is Naomi a widow, but her two daughter-in-laws are widows. And she, they begin, she says, let's go back home to my hometown, Bethlehem in Israel. She tells her daughter-in-laws, you come with me. They start the trip and that's not working. And so she says to both girls, you both go home. Go home to your, she says, go home to your families and to your gods. Go back to your old way of living. Well, the one daughter says, that's great. Yeah, I'm out of here. But the other daughter, Ruth, she says, no way. 
She says, I'm not going to do it. She says, the other girl, she can go, but she says, um, Mama Naomi, she says, where you go, I'm going to go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Did you hear that? Where you go, I go. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. So they stick together. And here's what you need to know about Ruth's um, biography. It's so good. She was a Moabite. Moabites were often considered adversaries of Israel. They were idolaters. They offered human sacrifice to this God called Chemosh. Now, I'm not saying that Ruth did that, but that's what she was used to. That was the country she grew up in. No wonder she got um, used to Naomi's God, who was not demanding of human sacrifice, who loved people and wanted to lead them by word and not by all these crazy sacrifices. And so she asked Naomi not to force her to leave her, to be separated from her. She wanted to stay in relationship with her. She saw her as a mentor and an advisor in her life. So Ruth knows that she doesn't want to go back to her Moabite ways, but she wants the new life with Naomi. Naomi, she is empty. She's bitter. But Ruth sees past her mother-in-law's pain to a new life. She and Naomi, they return to Bethlehem right at the beginning of harvest. What a perfect time. They're very poor. They're very needy. They're desperate, even just for some food. And Ruth asks a field manager for H-E-L-P. She says, let me glean and gather. She starts at early in the morning, the Bible says, and works throughout the day. But she asks the field manager, can I have some help? Please, may I glean in your field and gather. She gains a reputation quickly for being a blessing and a great help to her mother-in-law. I mean, she's got a reputation for being a blessing. She's thankful for any little opportunity to work and harvest. She calls that opportunity a blessing. She's thankful for even a little bit of water to drink and calls it a favor. Whew. She doesn't have one entitlement bone in her body. She doesn't think anyone owes her. She doesn't play the poor me card. She doesn't tell Boaz that the other girls are treating her not very nice and that she's a Moabite in Israel and they're looking down on her. She doesn't play any of those cards. She doesn't do any of that stuff. She's thankful and she's a haver. After she had got some help, she gave help. She gave help to her mother-in-law. After she had got food, nourishment, she gave Naomi food and nourishment. Remember, you can only give what you have, right? You can't give favor that you don't possess. Ruth did what Naomi told her. Every step of the way, she did what her mother-in-law told her. Her mother-in-law said, do this, dear. She said, yes, I'll do that. She gets to the field. The field manager told her, you go glean here. You do this here. She did what the field manager told her. She asked. And she obeyed. She did what she was told. Then she did what Boaz told her to do. She practiced H for having, E for expressing. She practiced L for identifying the lead. And she practiced P for pursuing. All those things. Ruth was an expert at getting help. And guess what happened to Ruth? Ruth became the wife of one of the most wealthy, influential men in all of Israel. Boaz. She basically became a princess overnight, a princess who could help help other people. She had already proven that she could help Naomi, and now here she is empowered to help many people. She became the great, great grandmother of one of the greatest kings of all time, King David the psalmist. And she became one of the only great ancestors ever mentioned in the Bible of King Jesus, Ruth. She became the great ancestor of Jesus, our eternal Savior. What's the conclusion? Getting H-E-L-P, getting help, pays off when you know how to do it correctly. Getting proper help makes it so that you can give help. In fact, sometimes you'll find yourself helping others and suddenly it'll open up doors for you to get help. It's the law of reciprocity. Luke 6, 38, what you give, it shall be given unto you. When you open up doors, doors open up for you. True help, I'll say this, usually comes with instructions. No, I feel like true help always comes with instructions. There's a saying, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Pam and I, we did a marriage conference a few years ago with one of the Robertson boys from the Duck Dynasty TV show. And their dad, Phil, he turned a love 
for duck hunting into making duck calls and a very successful TV show. Imagine if Phil only taught his sons how to eat duck, right? He taught them way more than that. He taught them business. He taught them investment. He taught them how to do things for other people. He gave them help, but he also expected them to help other people. And because of that, they have this successful hit TV show. True help always comes with instructions. You see, because treating the symptom instead of the problem is a problem. Treating the symptom instead of the problem is a huge problem. Giving a drug addict a few dollars to ease your conscience is exasperating the problem. Treating the rash but ignoring the disease, that's not going to end well. Giving your kid permission without parenting is setting up her for destruction. Giving someone a position without proper training and mentoring will hurt many, many people. Life experience, Bible anecdotes, history all point to getting help with instructions. The prodigal son wanted wealth without instruction. Instruction. Guess what happened? He lost everything and ended up living with the pigs. Samson wanted intimacy and relationship without guidelines. Guess what happened to him? He lost his strength, he lost his eyes, and he ended up losing his life. Queen Jezebel, she wanted power and control without God's oversight. Guess what happened to her? She became dog food. I mean, literally, dog food. Back to our hero Ruth, the Moabite, with all the odds against her, destined to fail in a faraway um, foreign land. And guess what happens to her? She becomes a princess because she works the laws of getting help and giving help. Ruth, let's look at verse 3. Chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Ruth, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And it says, And Ruth said to her, All that you say to me, I will do. Verse 6, So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had told her. Instruction. Do you see that? The beauty of instruction. She did all that her mother-in-law told her to do. Who do you listen to? Who are you listening to right now in your life? I mean, whose Facebook posts are you living off of, right? Whose words have permission to enter your mind? This is a big deal. Proverbs 18, verses 7 and 8 say this, A self-confident fool's mouth is his ruin. His lips are a snare to himself. Verse 8, The words of a whisperer or a talebearer are as dainty morsels. They go down into the innermost parts of the body. It's not that the other women weren't talking about Ruth. The other girls from Bethlehem were talking, oh, you know, she's not from around here. You know, she doesn't know us. What's, what's she doing in our field anyway? Like, we don't want her here. She's a Moabite. Like, we don't need her here. Like, I mean, she shouldn't be here. She should go back to her own people down south. I mean, we don't need people from the south telling us how to live. She just needs to get out of here, right? Have you ever heard words like that? Yeah, maybe. And yet, because Ruth was willing to get H-E-L-P, get help, to receive instruction, to humble herself, she became one of the most influential women in the world. Ruth ended up helping the community that they thought they didn't need any outside help. And she came in and she brought them great help. Who do you listen to? Ruth listened to a genuine mentor, someone with instruction. Ruth didn't have time for the words of a whisperer or a tale bearer because she was focused on getting help and giving help. If you were to look at Ruth's Facebook page, she wasn't talking about the problem. She wasn't gossiping. She wasn't into like, well, this social problem and this social problem and this thing. She was always talking the solution. She was bringing the antidote to a culture that needed a remedy, a true remedy. Proverbs 15, verse 32, he who refuses and ignores instruction and correction despises himself, but he who heeds reproof gets understanding. Remember our widow in Zarephath, right? The problem, the prophet came to her with instruction. It was the instruction from God that ended up being her help and included her giving help. If she ignored the instruction, the headline would have read, widow and son die with a cake in their mouth. Right? The religious people would have said, isn't that too bad? Well, just bless her heart. I guess it must have been her time to go. Pastor Stephen, that's, that's kind of sad. Ignoring instruction and correction is hating yourself. That's what the Bible says. When you ignore instruction and correction, 
you hate yourself. It's you hating you. Do you know how many marriages operate at 25% because they fail to get help? Ignoring instruction is not an excuse for your business falling apart or your health failing. When people have a problem, whether it's a relationship thing or a money thing or whatever, I'm always interested to see what value they place on instruction because it's not enough just to get help. We got to be able to give help. And if you can't, you can't make the thing work if you don't have the instructions. When you get instruction, guess what? You have the power to give instruction. Proverbs 23, 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Not only that, but also get discernment and get judgment, instruction and understanding. Can I lead you in a prayer? Pray this with me because I know more than anything, you want the real solution in your life. And the Bible says, Jesus is the answer. Let's invite Jesus into our lives. Jesus, I need your help. I need to be saved. You're the only one who has died on a cross for me, rose up from the grave. My hope is in you. Forgive me of all my sins. Help me to know God's love. Fill me with your spirit. Come into my heart. Now I'm a child of God. I belong to the family of God. In your name, Jesus, amen.